Uh, my name is Jonas Freeman. I'm from uh, Sweden. I live in Bali and I'm a conscious business investor and I'm a mindfulness coach. I will start by sharing the screen, see if that works well. And we'll get going since we're already in time. So if you can see the screen, then it says Jonas Freeman, mindfulness coach, sustainability. You can get a note in the chat box or maybe someone just unmuting for a second and saying, this is what you see. Bonnie, are you there still? Yes, good, please yeah. go ahead. Can you see? Yeah, okay, great. Then everything is working. So very short about me because I wanna reflect on some other things today. Uh, I'm a mindfulness coach. I work uh, as a conscious business investor and developer. And um, I have been, uh, yeah, also had a big break in life, I think, after being a successful entrepreneur in younger age. Uh, and I went uh, meditating, you might say. So what I'm gonna share to you today is partly uh, collected from this perspective on taking uh, perspective from the moon and looking down on humanity. Uh, I've been in the uh, corporate world and I've been dealing a lot with startups in my life. And the last, I would say maybe seven years only working with conscious businesses or what I define as conscious businesses. This is the term that you might not be acquainted with. Maybe you are. Uh, I coined it maybe nine years ago. And we are not going to talk about that. But that's usually what I give talks about, how you can run a business effortlessly, joyfully, and sustainably. Um, I want to mention just a few things about what I do today before we talk about sustainability. Um, it's all within the field, what I call conscious business. I'm a conscious business uh, consultant and investors. I go into company and I build them up. And I, yeah, companies that I think do something good for the world. I'm also a part of a, a global scientific sustainability initiative. I just recently started. It's called Planetary Balance. And it involves about 200 of the top scientists in the world and their vision, you might say, to uh, actually create impact in the direction of sustainability. Uh, also, I work in the field of digital education and I recently invested in a company called Opida. Uh, I also took over a company recently called Classic Swedish Yachts, that is sailing boats. And uh, I am a part of a clean tech innovation that deals with a place where we spend one third of our life or maybe 33 years of your life since you're a healthy dude or maybe even more. Um, and that is in all of our houses, that's mattresses. So this is a new patent, a ventilated mattress. So what I'm gonna talk about today is sustainability. And this is not normally my topic, but since uh, it's been an interest for me so, for so long, and I'm involved in many projects that are international and global. I hear a lot, I take part of a lot of research and things, and I'm gonna do a test talk. When Michael asked me to give a little talk, I thought maybe I'll test talk about sustainability and see what comes. Also, this is my first attempt to include something new. It's called subjective science. It's a term I just came up before this talk. Uh, to explain it a bit shortly, you know, we all know about science in general and research. Uh, and that's a very good thing. You know, it's a practical and rational perspective on things. It's like placing a net onto reality and then see what data we collect, like a fisherman do. And then we try to draw conclusions out of this. What is the trends and what can these data depend on? And we guesswork. And many times these guesswork is quite accurate. So it's very helpful for us to understand reality. Now, subjective science, why am I interested in this? Well, this is because of my own experience of reality. And looking down from the moon, I see that humanity as a whole, we tend to do a lot of things and create a lot of results that we actually don't want. 
We even say it out loud, we don't want this to happen. Still, we create the results. And we do it repeatedly, over and over again. So this is um, most likely due to the fact that we are not like science, rational and pragmatic. Human beings are highly irrational. <laughs> we are very emotional beings. And this is very rarely taken into consideration in these mathematical models. Even the very system that most likely you and me live within, that is market economy, is based on a view of a human being as a rational being. This is called economic man in economic terms. And it's a rational being and profit maximizing. But so much research exists around this that just says that the rational man is a myth. It doesn't exist. We are highly irrational. <laughs> And emotions, how we feel, what we feel is good and bad, determines how we take action. Even Nobel Prizes has been won proving this. Also, what I intend to do today is to introduce the herd of elephants in the room. In the room of sustainability, that is. You know, the, the elephant in the room is the thing that we don't talk about, that, but it's there and it's huge. Now I'm gonna talk about the herd of elephants in the room of sustainability today. So uh, don't take me seriously. This is a test talk. I'm gonna try some things out. Everything is new for me here. And let's see where we get. I actually prefer to have dialogues with people and interactions, but in 30 minutes, I will just run this through and you can make contact with me later if there's something that inspires or uh, you absolutely don't agree with and just have the urge to tell me. Absolutely welcome. So first, I'm gonna start telling you about an exercise. This is the same exercise I do when I give talks about conscious business. It's about to find out what real value is. So I challenge you all in this room, the Zoom room, to, to this exercise. I challenge you to send you to a deserted island. And I'm gonna give you a choice what to bring to this deserted island to rib live the rest of your life with. And when you choose something, you disregard or you sacrifice the other options. Are you with me? Good. So for example, here's an option of choosing money. Then you sacrifice good health, peace of mind, a thriving ecosystem, and great relationships around you. You can choose health, then you sacrifice money, you sacrifice peace of mind, a thriving ecosystem, and great relationships. You can choose peace, and then you sacrifice money, good health, a thriving ecosystem, and good relationships. You can choose a thriving ecosystem on this island, so that will exist there when you come, but then you sacrifice money, health, good health, peace of mind, and good relationships. Or you can choose to bring all the best friends and family that you have, great relationships to this island, but then you sacrifice money, uh, you have not so good health, peace of mind, you, know, you will worry and stress and feel some anxiety sometimes, and ecosystem will not be as thriving. So what do you choose? Yes, it's a tough one, and I don't have time for wait for answer in this particular thing. So you can write it in the chat box, or you can just uh, interrupt me uh, abruptly and just say what you choose. But it's not a apparent uh, choice, you know. Uh, when you start to think about it and um, and uh, and question your choice, like uh, Keke, he chooses ecosystem. Ah. It sounds like a rational good choice. Health first, said you, also a good choice. But then you don't have the ecosystem, yeah? So there might not be fresh fruits and food very easily. Ah, Tankish, he chooses peace. Very good. So then you have a calm and you feel content and happy regardless of the outer circumstances. Very wise, but you might have crappy health. <laughs> so this is just a fun discussion game. And you know, usually in the audience, we have a lot of fun with these things. But what I've found during all the years that I've been giving this specific exercise is this. No one has ever chosen money. 
Now, how come? Well, it's quite obvious when you start to actually think about it with a conscious mind. You know, all the other things represent what we experience as value. What is real value? Whereas money is merely the symbol of money. Now, how come humanity on a daily basis, everyday basis, so many uh, people, especially in the, what I call the Western or what we call the Western society and misunderstand me correctly, um, choose to sacrifice their individual health, their individual peace of mind. They sacrifice uh, ecosystem and they sacrifice great relationships in order to strive for more money. This is the big question. And an answer is we simply mistaken. Now, at the point of time where human consciousness right now, money is equally experienced value. So our mind, our consciousness believes that money is real value. That's so important. So why do I talk about this? Well, hopefully that will be more um, clearly later because if money feels like real value and we become really happy when we receive a big chunk of money and we feel safe, we feel like everything's gonna be fine. That's a very important piece of empirical research. Whereas if you sacrifice uh, something else uh, or you get peace of mind, you don't value it equally much or you know you have an ecosystem, you don't feel that that's great value. Now feelings, human emotions are extremely important for the decision-making process. And this is what we'll talk more about now. But first, I will show you some um, relevant data that this uh, group of um, complex system scientists that I'm involved with, the Planetary Balance uh, Project, they have taken from. So they did something historical. They met together at a conference uh, quite recently in December. They pretty much just emailed and texted each other, we need to meet and share uh, information. And that's what they did. They had a meeting in December in Stockholm and um, over 150 science, uh, scientists came in very short notice and they presented different experts view on this topic of sustainability. And what they found that we are much more urgent situation than they imagined when they compiled every data all together. So this is just one of the slides that I stole from this conference and it's uh, um, uh, approved by Stuart Kaufman. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it's Lars Larsen, uh, scientist who wrote this one. And what we see here is a timeline and we see the human uh, utilization of resources and uh, uh, exposure, yeah, how much effect we have on the biosphere, the ecosystem. That is the red thin line. You see the Viking age, that's uh, me, Jonas, <laughs> or my ancestors playing around up in Nordic uh, countries. And then we see Columbus uh, traveling to uh, North America. And uh, this is the origin of Western uh, colonization and spreading. And then we see USA being formulated. And USA is quite important in the historical terms and why we are unsustainable right now, because US is sort of the, the leader of human progress. You know, in the direction where US is heading, uh, the rest of the Western world and now also the Eastern world is following. So this is quite important. And there is a red um, square uh, at the end of the US uh, era. And this is where we see a real increase in um, unsustainable, that is a depletion of resources, for example, and uh, greenhouse gases uh, and those kind of things. And at 1988, something called IPCC, uh, I think that's intergovernmental uh, plan for, of, uh, on uh, climate change was formulated. And they sort of collected a lot of data and research and saw that you know, we have a little timeline. There's a little time window for us to create a bend in the direction of evolution towards sustainability. And since that, nothing has happened other than we just progress in direction of unsustainability. So we have, they say now 12 years to do something drastically to, to create the bend. And the bend is represented by this little green 
uh, line. That is a drastic change and then, you know, starting to stabilize and so the ecosystem and the biosphere that we have can uh, rebuild itself and we can survive as a species. So there are many more things than global warmings that these scientists came together and shared and they created a red list. Uh, I will not go through all of them, but just mention a few that, um, for example, uh, humanity has been dealing with an enormous um, mass extinction. Yeah, taste that word, mass extinction. Millions of species have been extinct and be due to humanity, and many of them are insects. Now imagine if we manage to uh, extinct the bee. We are very close right now, and the bee is responsible for 70% of human food production, 70%. I just imagine 7 billion people losing 70% of their food. This is a huge crisis. So also that in combination with the depletion of our food soil or um, farming soil uh, is another very urgent thing for humanity that, that I wasn't aware of, but over 40% of all farmland is completely depleted. Depleted means that nothing grows there if you don't put a chemical or an artificial fertilizer there. Now, when it comes to artificial fertilizer, it's derived from phosphor. Phosphor is a resource that is running out. The mines are getting empty of phosphor. So we just have a small gap of uh, time where we can sort of artificially make this soil work, and then we will have an enormous food crisis as well. So yeah, who will you sacrifice 40%? Who will be without food? So these are things that are very recent in time. And uh, also here you see the pandemic risk mentioned and those kind of things. And this was before the COVID-19 was discovered, but they already saw that this was coming. We have a very low resistance for uh, viruses and pandemic uh, as our immune system has developed over the years. Now, so that is data and scientists working. Now I will move into the new field I call uh, subjective science. So what I take into consideration here is things like emotions, how we feel about things due to the fact that this determines our actions. I also take in consideration a different approach to analysis and um, conclusions, which we can call, call intuition. So that is, I'm a mindfulness coach. I meditated for quite a few years. So I use a mindful approach. That is, I listen to a, a lot of information or data, but I don't evaluate it. I don't judge it. I don't put a label to it. I do nothing other than listening. Now this is a, of course, a skill you develop with time. And uh, most of the time, you know, we think <laughs> during listening and we oppose thing and we, we come up with our own thoughts and we go with that and we tell stories and those kind of things. And most of you in this room probably don't even listen to me. You listen to your own story going on in your mind and the data that you have in the story that you think is more true. But imagine if you just now try to just listen. How would that feel like? So try it out. And uh, this is how some of these lines that I now draw by hand pretty much, they are not derived from data, you know, the net, the fishing net, and we collect data. These are also, they are based on data, but they're also based on uh, experience of reality, how we experience reality. And this is very important in many fields of our life, but especially when it comes to sustainability. Because for so many years, we've been doing things that we know are unsustainable. And still we feel that it's the right thing to do to continue the way we do. That feels more safe. And it feels very scary for us to step in the direction of sustainability. Because how can I say that's true? Because no one does it. We have Paris agreements, we have Agenda 21, many agreements have been signed in nation's history and none of them have, has been followed. So 
I start with dollar sign in the left um, corner and it's a timeline. Now, um, bear with me. I will only talk about the timeline from the 50s. And why do I do that? Yeah, because when I talk about human history and we talk about human evolution, we see that this is a big stepping stone or shifting point in humanity history. At the end of 1950s, every nation on earth chooses to have GDP or GNP, growth national product, as the measurement of success for the nation. So every nation on planet earth measures success by the amount of money. That's a big change in humanity. So how did money go after that? Well, then we have to consider that we come from war. We had two world wars going on in the Western world. Uh, and they absolutely depleted our uh, resources and the monetary system. And we have a lot of starvation, not resources to eat and those kind of things. So this is where we come from. And then we introduce GDP. That is the assumption that if just amount of money increases in a society, then everything becomes better. We have the resources to improve everything. Okay, so this is how we pay the money line. This is not exact in any way. This is me hand drawing. But it, what I want to point out that it's going up, steadily up and increasing, um, and increasing. And this is also quite true to data. You can search for, for these kind of things. Let's see if I can see. So this is the success. What we focus on turned out to be very successful. We created a lot of money. I don't think anyone can today say that we have a lack of money. If you actually look into the amount of money that exists today, and for example, there was a guy who wrote a book about end of poverty. <laughs> so what he did was uh, just calculate how much it would cost to end world poverty. And that was a very, really interesting uh, scientific uh, experiment, I think. So it would be, um, if, and I don't remember the figures. This is the problem now, I forget about it. But it would be, for example, 1% of the US military budget per year to end world poverty. So it's not the amount of money that we lack, it's the how we prioritize money that might be a problem. So let's look into that. Now I'm gonna shift and I'm gonna put into this graph the ecosystem, the ecosystem. So we come from world wars and uh, we already experienced the boom of industrialism. So we have deteriorated the ecosystem. That is we, we have taken resources and depleted them. Ah, you know, we needed coal for the industries to work. We needed forest to the industries to work. But still, we're very high up if we compare to where we are right now, when we are at a, you know, acute crisis, according to 99% of the scientists today. So that has been going down all the way. Okay, so they are quite interesting to correlate, because it seems like in our progress of creating money, we have sacrificed the ecosystem. That is the real value that provides for us. Now I'm going to talk about health. So this is the line for health. It's the yellow line. So in the beginning, after the, in the post-war era, with more money, health improved enormously. You know, it was so much easier to create shelter, you know, roof over many people's uh, houses, uh, heads to create warmth so we don't freeze to death, uh, to create uh, yeah, heating up in the north and uh, to create uh, clean water systems and also to create more medication and those kind of things. So health and longevity, for example, increased enormously in these two decades or maybe three decades after the, the world wars that we have. So that, things get better with more money. Next one, peace of mind. And this is very important. It's how we perceive reality. You know, are we feeling content or or discontent. This is peace of mind, in my mind at least, how we feel about what's going on. So in the post-war time, it went better. This is the uh, pink line. 
you know, when we feel that there's optimism, you know, money and resources are coming in, um, we see that people get more food. You know, we had to do rationing in Europe just to survive. We become more happy and content. So we think that everything is great and the future is bright. And then we see, just like with um, health thing, oh, yeah, that it's starting to plane out and then deteriorating at the end. Now, you know, mental, emotional health is one of the biggest problems we have in humanity. So many people are stressing. My grandparents, they didn't even know what work-related stress was. Pressure on an everyday basis. Anxiety is huge. There's so many pills eaten just to cure anxiety. Ah, oh, we don't feel, we don't feel content. And you know, the 80s, 90s, you know, when we had a lot of wealth and, uh, you know, we also created new desires for new things and we started to create a discontentment, although we were safe, you know, on a physical level. So I'll just step back and this, to this one, the, um, the health line. And, you know, what we see now, and this is the first time in history that we see life expectancy going down the last decades. And we have never had this amount of diseases, for example, and we never had this amount of medications curing symptoms for diseases. So for the first time, you know, uh, I think health in humanity is going down. And I think uh, many people feel this, although there are very little data to actually provide um, to support that. Uh, yeah, well, obesity and those things and U.S. are now for the first time going down in life expectancy. So there are some figures that support it. But mostly, we, you know, if we just feel, you know, uh, there's a lot of diseases going on. And our immune system has been uh, weakened over years of, for example, depleting the soil. So there's no minerals and vitamins in the same salad uh, that you eat now that your grandparents ate. Okay. And that was peace of mind going down as well at the end, but very much up the first decades. And now let's talk about relationships. These are very important to some, not so important to, to some. It depends on our uh, history, but most of us love a really good relationship. But if we also include the collective relationships, you know, uh, look at um, the conflicts that we have, international conflicts, it became so much better uh, straight after the world wars. People and governments really made an effort to get along. They created uh, things to, to get along better, UN and you know, a, a European Union and those things. So we collaborate, not compete about resources. We connect together. And also, you know, when we get more health, we get more money, we get more uh, peace of mind, you know, we start to make love. We, we, when we don't worry about the next day getting a bomb in our head or, you know, how to survive, we start to become intimate. And yeah, I know most of us want to maybe ignore that this is a big part of being human, but we love intimacy and love. And it's a big part of how we experience reality. So this is going up drastically, you know, after the post-war, um, in the post-war time. And this is where the GDP is concluded to be the solution, the real succession measurement, because everything got better except ecosystem. So we could sacrifice ecosystem, but everything, how we feel, how we perceive reality got better. It's very difficult to perceive uh, entire ecosystem in a, in a, on a globe. Uh, yeah, we don't feel it, but the other things we can feel Ah, I talk about this to feel because the, a real experience is how we feel. Let's see if I remember what the next line. Yes. So this is the love line. It goes up and then it planes out. And then at the end, it starts to deteriorate. You know, uh, we see more conflicts arising. We start to see you know, in the 90s, uh, nations even starting wars to cynically win natural resources in different parts of the globe we start to see um, in political scene in most European countries and also in the US that nationalistic tendencies becomes more and more common, even fascist tendencies. So now it's a common scene, even in Sweden where I come from, you know, I think the nationalistic party, which have uh, some, you know, uh, quite a drastic view on humanity, uh, they got almost 10% in the last election. You know, that's, you can't even imagine that. 
So these are big tendencies. We see a lot of riots going on in a lot of countries. And we, I think that the, the relationship we notice on a daily basis, you know, we almost don't have time to making love, <laughs> to enjoy life and be intimate with each other and, and to have family time, for example. People are so busy with work, prioritizing, you know, making money. And then we have to do all the other things that we need to do to be a okay human beings. We be, are in society, we are in, a, um, we have to sport, we have to be fit like hell, and we have to be in different um, contexts and sit in, uh, in boards of, and we need to be uh, volunteering here and there. We need to take care of our children and all these kind of things. I think, you know, there's a reason to why we divorce, you know, and most people divorce, step get married. So I would say that relationship is going down as well. And this is a big part of how we perceive uh, reality. This is a big part of reality itself. So if we look at the real values, not the symbol of value, which is money, then we are heading down the golden waste bin. This is where, you know, the GDP mindset of uh, aiming for money and assuming that everything gets better takes us. This is reality. In the beginning, it turned out to be great in the post-war era. Everything got better and that's when we got completely tricked. So that's, we stopped questioning uh, market economy and GDP as a measurement. Yeah, of course, there has been uh, questioning and you all know about Bhutan probably, growth, national happiness and those things. But you know, on the bigger mainstream scale, it doesn't happen. It just progresses. So this has led us to very close to extinction of humanity, if we ask the scientists. Let's see. So why is this? When we have known about this, we have seen the ecosystem deteriorating, you know, from the 70s and 60s, there are big movements starting that already saw this coming. And scientists already established this curve. This is where we're heading. And still we have been prioritizing to sacrifice the ecosystem in order to make more money. Why is that? In order to give my reflection on that, I need to introduce an analogy. I can see what time it is. This is a pen and it's um, a symbol of our mind. The tip of the pen, the one we see with the color is the conscious part. This is where we're wise, we're smart and we have good experience and we can think of things. But the big part of the pen is the subconscious. The subconscious um, is programmed, cultivated through our childhood, parents, experience with our parents and the society, all the movies that we saw, um, the TV that we watched, the experience, the traumas that we had, the desires that we had, everything is charged and uh, tar targeted in, into the subconscious mind, which is the big part. And here comes the interesting part. The subconscious mind determines emotions, how we feel about things. So the conscious mind don't want to agree about this. It wants to be rational. Just muting the microphone. Yeah, the conscious mind probably don't want to agree about this. It wants to think that it decides about how it feels. But if you really think about it, we have very little control of how we feel. And think about, for example, you know, have you ever stressed for a deadline, for example? Yeah, raise your hand. Yeah. Although you knew that the stress itself didn't help the situation, or you either didn't want to feel stressed you wanted to feel calm and still do the things. How many have felt stress although you didn't want it or you knew it didn't help? Yeah, I would say everyone in this room and uh, in the Western world would raise their hand. Of course we have. We don't decide when stress is coming. You know, there's a thought coming, deadline, and then stress is there. Take worry, for example. Have, have you ever worried about something? Maybe, you know, the to pay the bills uh, this month or uh, what the boss is gonna say tomorrow. Although you knew that the word itself didn't help the situation. 
we didn't even want to feel worry. Of course we have, because we don't determine about emotions. Have you ever had, you know, a, a strong desire for crap food, like feeling like mouth watering <laughs> about crap food or drinking alcohol or something, although you knew that that was a bad habit or you shouldn't do it now because it will have consequences later. Of course we do. We don't, we don't determine how we feel about things, desires that come up. Or have you ever, you know, uh, <laughs> felt attraction to someone although you knew you could never get that person, or you f even fell in love with someone, although you knew it was the wrong person to fall in love with, you know, that kind of Hells Angels logo on the back is a giver, you know? <laughs> of course, we all have felt attraction or even felt in love with someone that, you know, we didn't intend to because we don't decide about emotions. That is the subconscious mind. And this is why I bring this up to the topic because the subconscious, has turned into the GDP emotions, the GDP myth. It, we've been bathing, we've been marinated in the success, the holy grail, the trophy, the success is money and everything becomes better. I will tell you that every system has been designed to produce more money. Every system, human system has been designed to either create more money or create human beings that create more money since late 50s. This includes school system. So if you grew up any time from that, we are marinated. That's the foundation of our subconscious mind. We don't want to admit it, but you know, still you worry about money going down and you don't feel equally urgent about ecosystem being deteriorated and depleted. So it's in this first couple of or three decades where uh, GDP is formulated and said to be the holy grail, the success measurement system for every nation. And then it was proved because everything got better except for the ecosystem that we live by. So, but we felt that everything got better. And then this assumption is the, is the foundational belief system that we have even today when we question things, we still don't question the, the fundament belief systems. Okay, I'm gonna move on. I, I actually don't have a clock here. This phone seems to be died. So now I'm gonna mention the herd of elephants in the room of sustainability. It's population growth. I take this graph from, um, what's it called? Jeff Gibbs and uh, Michael Moore's latest movie. I just did a print screen. Uh, it uh, paints 12,000 years of human history and population growth. Now this graph is around in the 60s or 70s when we really have wealth and we have uh, you know, a lot of money that creates security and people can screw around and feel optimistic about life. And then it goes up like this. Now in statistical terms, this is just a beyond crazy statistics. That rise in human population is beyond what we could foresee. It just goes straight up to 7 billion from being under 1 billion in the 60s and 70s. That's fantastic. Now, what uh, Jeff Gibbs and Michael Moore did in the next slide I'll show you, is to take human consumption per person and add to this population growth plus consumption. And then we get a fantastic rise. We consume so much more per person than we did, you know, uh, just a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, this Lars uh, that I mentioned, the uh, uh, scientist, for example, he calculated how much his own life in usage of resources was compared to his uh, previous, um, previous families. And it turned out that he spent in, uh, resources in his lifetime compared to 35 generations in his uh, family tree, 35 generations. And if he compared with um, indigenous people, the Maasai people, 
he uses 270 times more energy than what they use. So this is per person. So that in combination with population growth creates this graph that is beyond. This is absolutely fantastic to see. What an increase. And this is still, you know, it's 12,000 years that we do and still it goes up vertically like this. So why? Now we start to summarize that. Why don't we feel it's urgent with sustainability and still strive hard achieving the symbol of value, sacrificing real value? Well, it is because of this. It's the GDP emotions, you know, our subconscious and emotional system is, you know, marinated and we feel that money is the real value. We feel that. That's why it feels logical to talk about uh, uh, unemployment and economical growth and all these things. We feel more safe if we have a government that uh, proves that it gets economic growth up. And they might say, you know, we want to fix the ecosystem and uh, we don't feel that, uh, uh, that that's a good investment. That plus the population explosion equals evolutionary waste beam for humanity as we know it. If we continue, that's where we're heading. And we have 12 years, according to the scientists, to create a drastic shift. So what is the solution then? Let's uh, reflect on this as well. So this is the 12 years that we have um, before, um, yeah, it goes in a direction where we, we experience all the consequences of global climate change. And we will have more and more difficulty living as a species on this planet. And we will have food starvation and big crises on all areas of human life. Sorry to sound a bit <laughs> gloomy, <clears throat> but is the solution then green tech, which is the big focus right now. Uh, is it that we create more cleaner energy and we create more clean uh, resource um, efficient technology? Well, if we look at it from a, uh, from a perspective of Michael Moore's just presented, it's just not, not enough. Did you see this one? Remember this one? It's not enough. It's not a chance that that will help. So solution, as I see it, is death. And this is what, you know, most of the subconscious mind, we are so afraid of death on the subconscious level. This is why we don't talk about it. But something needs to die for something new to be born, especially if it's something that is quite far away from the current system. And this is something very natural in nature, you know, uh, a leaf need to you know, die in order to give uh, room for the next leaf. A, new tree, a tree needs to eventually die at some point to give room for other trees and to give nutrients to the soil so other things can grow and newer versions of the tree can come. And you know, it's either that we kill the GDP myth or we kill off the population. You can try this uh, simple equation by just, okay, if we remove population, uh, then if a few people live on planet Earth, we can still use a lot of resources uh, and still the, the planet will recuperate. So that's the equation. And also, if we become more, we kill the uh, GDP myth and instead we give value to real value, and that is the ecosystem, uh, health, uh, peace of mind, relationships, then we can be many people because we become a part of the ecosystem. We might even be a, a contributing factor to a thriving ecosystem. So the equation you know, goes both ways and there are most likely those who goes with the population kill off, uh, probably those who have a lot of wealth, for example, and benefits you know, I, I'm not saying that is so, but it's likely that that seems to be a good solution because the other uh, solution means that I might lose something. And this might be true for many of us. We are dead scared to kill off the GDP myth because it's a part of our self-image. It's a part of our identity. It's a part of our ego. We built our personality based on these things, the subconscious, our whole emotional system feels it's gonna die if we kill that myth. So this is why it becomes really difficult to make drastic changes for humanity and why we decade after decade have been sacrificing real value in terms of making more money. 
but I go with solution two, uh, the, the second solution here, and that is to um, kill off the thoughts that we have, the belief systems, the GDP myth. And then I would add, we also need to invest in real value before that feels good, before it feels secure to shift this and make a drastic change. We need to start investing in the ecosystem. I heard about, I don't remember his name now, but a Swiss uh, billionaire who's investing in uh, land, buying forests to turn them into national parks, for example. You know, for, for our emotional body, that is a big risk. <laughs> that is a really unrational thing to do because it doesn't give you profit. And health, you know, we need to start investing in real health, not just to subdue the symptoms of things. We need to build real good immune systems. Then pandemics and viruses are not a problem. We need to build inner peace because, you know, the restless mind, addictive human mind is, you know, we can't change anything if we are in this state of stress and pressure and feel restless. We don't see new potentiality. We don't see new possibilities when we're in a state of stress. Relationships, the thing that we feel secure and safe, we need to invest in those, although we don't make profit out of it. And this needs to happen before we have um, uh, reprogrammed our subconscious to feel that that is real value. And that will happen. This is what will happen if we invest. We will start to see a bend and then all these things that are real value will go up and we will synchronize it with a symbol of value that is money. So at some point we will feel that the money is a representation of value, of the real value. It's, it's not real value itself. Okay, I'm sure I've been going over 30, although I didn't check when we started really. Um, this is uh, me and uh, this is my contacts. And I hope you have a great day. And this at least um, brought a few thoughts up to that space of um, mind that we call consciousness. Looking forward to uh, see you soon again. If there is another uh, speaker that are about to talk now, just interrupt me and go ahead and give a talk. Otherwise, I will remain here for a few minutes if there is uh, questions or something. Thank you. Hi, Jonas. This is Varun, uh, Tanjish, so to say. Uh, are you there? Yeah, are you? Uh, yeah, Jonas. So I had a couple of questions. Uh, I have reached out to you on email separately. Thank you so much for this session. Uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, two questions. Oh. Where did you meditate and with whom? Ah, okay. Um... I started meditating before I um, <laughs> knew I was meditating. Um, a way to survive, to sleep. So I just Googled, I think, uh, something and uh, started to meditate. And of course, it worked. I, I became more peaceful in mind and I could sleep. Then I went into meditation. So I would say I went to India and uh, the main teacher is someone called the Sri Ramana Maharshi. I never met him in live, uh, live context. <laughs> he died in the 50s. But uh, that simple question to live in the question of yourself, the ego, who am I, is something that helped me enormously to disconnect from my subconscious, my emotional states, and find the reality beyond the thinking mind. Uh, but yeah, I have many well. teachers. I meditated with Dalai Lama and I meditated with unknown yogis and rishis in the caves of Himalaya. And I had many also Western enlightened people like Byron Katie and uh, Eckhart Tolle's teachers. Um, yeah. Teach not hard. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for welcome. that. Thank we you. have the same teacher. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, second question. When you say the consciousness business uh, that you're investing in that, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So conscious business is comprised by two words, conscious and business. 
So business as we know it is uh, defined just like GDP. It's a process that makes money. If it makes money, then it's a business. If you don't, then it's a hobby. If I put conscious in front of that, that means we dare to question it. It's just like meditation, if you may, you know? We dare to question ourselves and the image of business that lives within us. So if you, for example, experience as a leader of a business or as a worker within a corporate, that wait a minute, I get a lot of consequences by following these success recipes as a pro successful leadership or you know, a successful business that I don't want. For example, today we see pressure and stress and uh, hierarchies where we compete within organizations instead of or, uh, collaborating, all these things. You know, there's a long list of things. Then we need to question it. And this is what I mean, a really groovy, jazzy leader dares to question him or herself. And it's about questioning yourself, not so much a question others. That's what turns a leader into a conscious leader. And if you actually think about it, this leads to progress, real progress. It leads to development. So it means that we not just um, take the fundament belief system that is already served, we are marinated in, and then we progress from there. We actually question the foundation itself. And this is very common when you work with product development. I don't know if anyone worked with that, you know, but if you hold up your phone, for example, that phone doesn't look the same as the first version, does it? The first version was not as good because there was a lot of young boys and girls questioning the first model and developed a new model. Now, if you look at the main uh, political, uh, financial systems, and also school systems, these are systems that hasn't really been questioned. That is, they haven't progressed and updated continuously. And that's why we now need to die. Something we, we feel that there's a big thing needs to die in order for us to become sustainable. And um, so it's the same with um, you and me, or I don't know if you're an entrepreneur or so, but I run several businesses. And uh, when I start to question, you know, the success recipes that I was fed with, the 10 steps to success for a business, 10 steps to success within marketing, 10 steps to success, success within leadership. When I question it, I find my success recipe and created much more sustainable business where a business as I know it, it becomes more and more effortless the more I work. <laughs> That's the opposite of the results that I experienced before I was 27. Then, you know, the more I worked, the more stress and pressure I experienced every year, the more anxiety I had. So yeah, I'm very happy to have good teachers in this and yeah, it's a very short explanation, but I, hopefully it makes sense. That's conscious business for me. Daring to question yourself in order to uh, update your leadership uh, in business. Thank you for that. Very welcome. Do we have another speaker in room five? Then please just grab the mic and kick me out. If not, I can take another question if there is any. Given that lineage in discussion um, <laughs> related to conscious business and this whole uh, driven by story to hit targets or whatever, um, <laughs> uh, who's doing the doing? Well, it depends on how deep down the rabbit hole you want, you want to go, I think. And I think you know that as well, you. <laughs> Who is doing the doing? Well, it's a, it's a genius question. And then metaphysically, how and why do things happen as they do? Yeah. Maybe we should go there. Or maybe we should leave it for another talk. That's my, <laughs> my reflection. But what I, just, just to give a short perspective of it, what I've found over my years, and I might be 100% true, that individual human beings are unsustainable. For example, you know, now the top of a, of a career letter is a burnout. This is what most people need. You might disagree, but you know, statistics, when I started to give talks about stress and those things, there was 40 million people that had burned out in Europe. This was 2014. 40 million people, that's an enormous amount. And these are only the one caught in statistics. And I have a good friend here in Bali, his name is Dr. Mahendra Shah. He's one of the big uh, sustainability workers. He's the man behind Agenda 21 and uh, you know, the uh, World Aid uh, 
concerts and those things, uh, African famine, and he's been involved in everything that has the sustainability pretty much. And uh, he has a good heart, but he came to the same conclusion. Hu humanity is not sustainable because human beings are not sustainable. So, you know, this is why uh, I encourage in my you know, business retreats uh, and my coaching and things, you know, for every individual to question himself, you know, or herself, who is doing the doing then can become a fantastic question leading you further and further down the layers of belief systems and um, maybe one day lead you to a complete freedom of outer circumstances complete freedom of the old conditioning of the mind because you become more and more an observer of the event we call life you become less and less the event itself that is the emotions and the thinking process going on and the outer circumstances that is in real time connection with our mind. And that is creating the triggers for our mind. Uh, I don't know if this is an answer, but yeah, it's a very good question. I would love to spend another hour listening to you talking about that because I feel it came from a place of wisdom. Well, the, the point behind that though, is that the whole issue of the problems that you face uh, take you away from the perfection of the moment. And somatically, fear, need, and desire feel very different from joy, gratitude, and wonder. Yes. And so You're action right. from joy, gratitude, and wonder in the perfection of the moment as a question to the universe, you and that which you think is not you, then refining that relationship becomes an interesting endeavor. And whatever you're doing is just context for your own personal development. Yes. I would uh, listen to that and feel that it resonates also in my mind. And it's funny that you mentioned because uh, a bit of the, the tool that I give away in talks about conscious business and conscious leadership is where do thoughts and emotions come from? This is the origin of human creation process. You know, thoughts arises, emotions arises, we feel good, joy and those kind of things. So we feel, you know, stress and we feel panic about something. And then that can move into we thinking about it. We formulate words around it. That is another layer. Uh, maybe we make a plan and then we take action. And then we get some kind of physical consequence. It becomes results. But if you back up, you know, the first thought or the emotion, where does it come from? I think this is where you're diving into you. I'm not sure. But what I found that these can come from exactly what you say. They can either come from a source of love, trust, or they can come from a, a foundation of fear, distrust. And Generally speaking, the only two I, when, yeah? you, when you live from your deepest truth, the premise is that health, wealth, happiness, and all the things that you had and sustainability happen naturally. And so who yes. are you at your deepest truth? And what is the underlying, we both know the answer to that is stillness, but as stillness emerges, what is it that takes you out of that? And then metaphysically, how and why is that showing up the way it does? Hmm. You wanna answer that? <laughs> 